Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, again, I'm Samantha Penta. I'm an assistant professor here at the University at Albany. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, our work looking at risk perception, information seeking, and protective actions for COVID-19. This is work I'm doing with uh, colleagues Amber Silver, another assistant professor at the University at Albany, and Lauren Clay, associate professor at DUville College. And I'd also like to take a quick moment to thank the National Science Foundation for supporting this work. Now, uh, the basis of this study is grounded in the notion that how the COVID-19 pandemic unfolds is fundamentally linked to human behavior. What protective actions people do or don't engage in will shape how COVID-19 spreads. So that means that it's incredibly important to understand what people are and are not doing and why they're doing it. But with COVID-19, there's a couple of unique uh, conditions or, or uh, characteristics that are important to keep in mind. The first is that COVID-19 is invisible, right? You cannot see the coronavirus with the naked eye. So then this begs the question of what cues do people use to understand the threat when the threat itself is not visible? And then how do those cues shape risk perceptions and behaviors, right? The second characteristic that's really important in understanding COVID-19 behavior is the enduring nature of this hazard. The COVID-19 pandemic has already lasted for months and it's going to be lasting for several more. So then how do these cues change over time? And then how do the associated patterns with risk perception and behavioral responses change over time? So these questions and the study are itself are grounded in the protective action decision mod model, which was developed by Lindell and Perry. And according to this model, things like uh, environmental and the social context, so things like environmental cues, social cues, characteristics of individuals, the information they're receiving and how they're getting that information, that all shapes psychological processes, which include things like risk perception and perceptions of important stakeholders, which in turn, ultimately facilitate or lead to behavioral responses, which are themselves also shaped by situational impediments and facilitators. Okay, so we uh, explore this for COVID-19 using a three-pronged data collection approach that involves a survey, collection of news media, and collection of social media data. And I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about that data collection in more detail. So the main focus of our data collection is on a repeated cross-sectional design survey. This is a web-based survey and Qualtrics is both administering the survey and generating the sample for us. We're administering the sample in three states, Louisiana, New York, and Washington, which allows us to get some geographic comparisons as well as some comparisons with different experiences of the virus itself. Uh, we uh, are sampling um, based on race, gender, income, and age for a quota-based sample. We're using census data to generate those quotas. We are doing 12 waves of data collection. Uh, data collection started in May. The first couple of waves are a little bit longer. So they are uh, about seven weeks in duration and they're a little bit larger in terms of our sample size. So we've got 1500 uh, participants in the first wave and then uh, a little over 1300 in the second wave. Starting with wave three, our waves are exactly four weeks in length and we're aiming for 700 to 900 participants in each wave with a goal of 300 participants from each of our states. We're currently in wave four with an eye of ending data collection in the summer of 2021. So we're gonna have a year of data on this. Um, the survey content, the survey questions themselves ask about all those components of the PADM model. And we have some additional questions that look at things like pandemic stress, health literacy and food availability as well. So pretty comprehensive. Now that survey data collection is being complemented with use of traditional and social media. Uh, so the, the traditional media, news media that we're collecting comes from two newspapers from each of our states of, of focus uh, and some uh, additional national news coverage provided by CNN Wire and then we're also pulling from the national coverage from the New York Times. The social media we're collecting is Twitter data from important international, national, and state level actors. So to give you some examples, we're pulling from like the World Health Organization, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, and state level public health agencies. Now our main purpose in pulling this data, uh, or pulling these uh, data sources initially was to get more information on those social and environmental cues, but we're uh, collecting this data for the duration that we're running the survey. So these two data sets are becoming really interesting and, and quite powerful in their own right and offer some really unique opportunities to look at how COVID-19 
is being presented and discussed in these two media forums. So with that, I'll thank you so much for your time and thank you to the COVID Information Commons for the opportunity to talk about our work. Thank you.